We have some cool stuff to cover today. Uh, I thought it was going to be rather technical, but in, in working on it, I realized there is some interesting material that is original to me and I hope is correct. So I'm going to distinguish what is my uh, views and what is standard canonical objectivism. But there are some uh, questions that are, the answers to which are only suggested in Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, and I've tried to fill in some of the details in the direction that was suggested. Okay, so we are covering special cases of concept formation, concepts that uh, call for separate discussion because they're not obvious, they're difficult, they don't seem to fit the pattern, although in the end they do. Those are concepts of characteristics, concepts of consciousness, and axiomatic concepts, each of which requires a separate discussion. And I want to begin with concepts of characteristics and this is where I'm filling in a lot that's not in explicitly Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. Concepts of characteristics, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by a characteristic? I'm using characteristic in the widest sense here to mean anything that characterizes a subject, an attribute of it, what it does, relationships of it to other things, pretty much anything you can say that's true of it. For example, a table's brown, that's a characteristic, it's long, characteristic's wooden, characteristic's sturdy, modern, expensive. Now you say expensive implies a relationship and a relationship to consciousness. Things in nature are expensive and no thing by itself is expensive or inexpensive. It's in relation to the money supply, the prices of other things, the choices of acting individuals. But nevertheless, I'm calling that a characteristic for the purpose of figuring out how a concept like expensive is formed. That's what we're interested in. Now, actions are not part of the identity of the thing that acts. And I know that because I asked Ayn Rand, would that be part of the identity of the thing, what it, what it does? No, she said. Meaning that I am talking now is not part of my identity. I think she regarded it as too, and I do too, as too ephemeral, as too transitory, that I can talk that I am, as Aristotle put it, a grammatical animal would be part of my identity, but that at uh, 8.50 a.m. on a certain Monday, I was talking is not a characteristic of me. Nevertheless, we're, but I'm for short including actions as characteristics, even though they're really not because I don't want to have to say each time a characteristic or an action. We're interested in how these concepts are formed. We're not here to make metaphysical distinctions. We're simply asking, well, when you say Fido is barking, how do you form the concept barking? So it's just a convenient way of not repeating the word and actions each time. Don't make any metaphysical federal case out of it. But one thing I am excluding is parts. My nose is, is a part of my face, which is part of my head, which is part of me. My nose is an entity. It is not a characteristic. What's the difference? A part can be separated. A part can be separated. Some of you probably have had nosectomies. <laughs> it's not a popular operation, but you can have your nose removed. It does come off. It can be cut off. But you can't, unfortunately, cut your age off. An agectomy does not exist. You, you can't remove the tan from the skin. 
You can remove the skin because that's an entity from the thing that has the skin, but you can't remove the color of the skin from the, from the skin. It's not a part. An, a characteristic is an inseparable aspect of the thing. Ayn Rand has made this distinction going back for attributes, going back at least to 1962, and I would guess to the 40s. An attribute is an inseparable aspect as opposed to a part which is separable. So I'm not talking about parts. They're easy to understand. You know, they're conceptualized just like entities are. They're located in space, and you can point to them. So the issue is, by what process do we focus on isolate and conceptualize characteristics rather than just using them to conceptualize entities? That is the problem. Now, I assume you don't quite appreciate that yet, so I'm going to elaborate. When you conceptualize table, you use your awareness of attributes. You use your awareness of the shape that's flat. You see that it's flat as opposed to look, look at the chairs around here. They got backs, but the tables are flat. They're level as opposed to the podium, which is slanted, if you can see it, it's slanted down. They have a certain shape, a table shape. They have legs that support them. So you are perceiving and fo even focusing on the attribute of shape, but you're not isolating and conceptualizing shape. A two-year-old certainly has the concept table. He certainly does not have the concept shape. How do we get concepts of attributes, characteristics like shape, rather than just make them the means of getting other concepts? I have on a blue shirt. A child could very easily distinguish me from the gentleman here who's wearing a pink, pinkish shirt. He could be aware perceptually of the difference. But it appears as this shirt is different from that shirt. It doesn't appear as this color is different from that color unless you already have the concept color, but that's what we're trying to explain. So normally we use perceptual awareness of characteristics to discriminate and classify entities. We see through them, they are transparent to the user. Well, they, are, they are the window we look through and not, we're not looking at the glass in the window. We use them to dis distinguish objects. Okay, and long quote from Ayn Rand, in the process of forming concepts of entities, a child's mind has to focus on a distinguishing characteristic, i.e. on an attribute, in order to isolate one group of entities from all others. He is therefore aware of attributes while forming his first concepts, but he is aware of them perceptually, not conceptually. It is only after he has grasped a number of concepts of entities that he can advance to the stage of abstracting attributes from entities and forming separate concepts of attributes. And she says the same is true of motion, and we're, we're covering that under um, characteristics as if the motions were characteristics. So here's the issue. How do we focus on isolate, abstract, conceptualized characteristics rather than just using them to conceptualize entities? These are not first level concepts. Blue is not a first level concept. But the only higher order concepts we've discussed are widenings or narrowings. Blue is not wider than shirt. It's not, it's not commensurable. It's not in the same CCD with shirt. Apparel is wider than shirt. Color is wider than blue, but the two, blue and shirt, are not on the same axis. It's not a narrowing. 
You know, you could have the concept blue shirts, red shirts, but we don't because it's not a fundamental, it doesn't warrant a concept, but you could have that. You could make up a concept. That would be a narrowing of shirts. We're not looking for that. We're looking for how do we get to blue? Now, you have to beware here the fallacy I call retroactive self-evidency, which is imagining that what is obvious after a learning process would have been obvious without it. So it's a subjective notion of self-evidency. For instance, it's just obvious that if you want to copy a block of text, you drag your mouse over it, go up to the edit, menu and you'll find copy under it or you do control C. I mean, that's just self-evident. That's just, you open your eyes and you know that. Every computer program is self-evident once you've learned it and totally baffling before you've learned it. So after you've learned it, oh my God, is it, what are you asking? Why can't you see how to do this? It's just obvious. No, it's obvious after you've learned it and automatized it. It's not obvious to the beginner. Same with characteristics. You might be thinking, well, come on, blue. You just focus on the color and ask yourself, what color is it? How does this color differ from that? But we haven't got the concept color yet. Color is a widening from blue and red and green and yellow. We're asking how you get to blue. How do you stop using perceptual awareness of blue to distinguish the blueberry from the blackberry and focus on blue? Now, it's not a tremendously difficult process because we have a theory of abstraction. Now here is the wrong metaphysics for that theory of abstraction. The pincushion model of characteristics. This is the Lockean, John Locke's theory of characteristics relationship to entities. The characteristics in here stick into the substratum, which is that pale blue circle I have these bars stuck into, or proceeding out from. What is the substratum? It's that, Locke says, it's that which has the attributes, but itself has no attributes. Excuse me, isn't that one of them, their uh, logical contradictions? It's that which has the attributes and has no attributes? Yeah. So Locke deprives the entity of any identity other than these attributes that are stuck into an unknowable something. And that's not my term, unknowable. He says it's a something I know not what. So that's the wrong model. This is a better model. Now, all these models are imperfect and dangerous. But the better model is that the thing is its attributes. The thing is its attributes. Now here I'm presenting attributes as if they were parts. They have spatial location. That's where the thing falls down. To abstract is what we want, and to abstract is to isolate mentally. How do we do that? Well, in objectivism, we're kind of fond of the process of differentiation. We love integration too, but integration comes from the simpler process of differentiation. As we saw with concept formation, similarity, which is the basis of integration, is a big difference compared to a little difference. It's a big difference swamping a little difference. The little difference appears as similarity, and we can integrate. So differentiation is the basic process of awareness. Consciousness is a difference detector, I like to say. Abstraction, and here we're interested in abstraction of characteristics, is differentiation. Now, this idea is unique to objectivism. There's no statement in Ayn Rand exactly like that, so I'm giving you my formulation, but I'm pretty sure that that's what she holds. So how do we differentiate that yellow area, which is one characteristic, from the other characteristics? 
Not from the entity, the entity is its characteristic. So how do we single out one characteristic from the others? The easiest way is when it's present or when it's absent. The same object. I'm now talking. Then I wasn't, right? Talking was there, not there. Same person, same attention of you. So it's easy to get, hey, he was talking, then he wasn't talking. He was doing something. Then he wasn't doing something. So things that can come and go, such as actions, are pretty easy to conceptualize because you can differentiate everything was the same except he stopped talking. <laughs> okay, so that is the easiest and simplest way to conceptualize those characteristics which can come and go. And what you're using is differentiation, or as I call it, Mill's method of difference applied to epistemology. Mill's methods are methods for scientific experimentation. You keep everything the same and alter one factor. If you get the effect when that factor is present and don't get it, when that factor is absent, then that factor is the cause of the effect. Here I'm applying it to differentiation abstraction. If I'm exactly the same, except I'm talking sometimes and not talking other times, you can focus your attention on the talking rather than on me. The next method for getting characteristics applies where you can't get rid of the character. You don't, it's not present sometimes and absent others. For example, uh, that I am an animal. I don't mean he's an animal. I mean I am in that biological kingdom. And I hope you are too. You can't, you can't, you know, it's not like on Tuesdays, I'm an animal, and then I'm a plant on Wednesdays. Uh, I'm all, you can't separate it. You can't use the present absent. There, there are even you know, things that have colors that don't change. The fire truck. It's red all the time. Now, you could sneak in and paint it some other color, but it's not going to happen for the child. So how could the child get red if the things that are red are pretty much red all the time? Blood, it's red. Well, one way he can do it is by the method of agreement, which is if everything is different except one thing and the cause is present, uh, the, the effect is present when that thing is there, regardless of what else is there, then that thing is the cause, for example, People in the hotel get food poisoning. So you interview them. The only thing that's in common among the people who got food poisoning is that they ate, they ate the clams in the restaurant. Some of them, I don't mean to libel this, restaurant, this uh, hotel. I'm, not, I'm speaking hypothetically. <laughs> it would be slander anyway. It wouldn't be libel. Um, some people ate the pastries, some didn't. Some people ate the beef, some didn't. Some people had the mayonnaise on the sandwich, some didn't. But of all the people who got sick, the only one factor that's present all the time in them is they ate the clams. Then you know the clams are the cause. In the same way, if you have a lot of far-flung uh, cases of things that are red, and they differ in every respect except one, the color, you isolate the color. So a fire truck, a tomato, a sunset, blood. Now look at the differences there. Blood's a liquid, a tomato's a solid, a fire truck is a man-made hard metal object, a sunset is air at a great distance. Nothing's in common except one thing, the color. That's the method of agreement, it's like eating the clams. 
The child uses this probably more than any other method for getting characteristics that are not transitory, that don't come and go. He sees the same color in various quite different objects. The only thing that's the same is the color. His attention is drawn to that. He, now, he can only do this after he's conceptualized fire truck, tomato, sky, he probably doesn't eat sunset in particular, sky, blood, because otherwise he'll be, over, he'll be overloaded. His crow will start, start cawing if he tries to focus on the characteristics in common, he's just struck with. Look at that stuff that, what did you call that, blood? It's coming out of my finger, what is, you know, isn't that, that's not when he's gonna be conceptualizing red. So he has to have the certain stability of knowing that these are entities and knowing what they are and being comfortable with them before he can use the method of agreement. Now here's the neat thing. The method of agreement is a method of difference. It is a differentiation. It's a second order differentiation. You're differentiating the things that are different from the things that are not different. Red was the only thing that wasn't different. It stands out because it's the only sameness. So you're differentiating the varying from the not varying, the different from the not different. It's still a differentiation, that's how it works. It's a second order method of difference. The third means is really my own. The, the first two are, I'm going to show you when we get to consciousness, discussed by Ayn Rand not quite under that heading and not as a general truth, but in regard to consciousness. But I came up with this pretty cool third method of differentiation. And I think it's right, I'm not sure how important it is, but it's so cute that I like to cover it. And let's turn to that. Where does red come from? Well, what entity or substance is most prominently red in human you know, experience before you get to civilization. Blood, yeah. So the old English and Teutonic for blood is rud, R-U-D, as in he has a ruddy expression, meaning he has a red bloody expression. So I figured out they must have used, they must have used blood as the first metaphor for uh, red. So the idea was you conceptualize blood and then you point to the sunset and you say blood. Yeah, it looks like blood in the sky. A tomato or some fruit, they wouldn't have had tomatoes, some, some fruit in the jungle. Blood. Blood-like. Blood-ish. Bloody. And that's ruddy and is red. That's where we get red from. Action terms. You're on your computer and somebody says, mouse over to that menu item. Well, the mouse is an entity, right? But it's an entity with a characteristic action and you've named the action, mouse over there, by the entity. Skiing. Skis are entities. Skiing is the action you do on skis. I jetted over from LA. The jet is an, en is an entity. So in many ways, still to this day, we use entity concepts in the place of characteristics or actions. Look at all the colors that are named for entities. Coral, rose, aquamarine, robin's egg blue. So we tend to use, we can see the origin of these characteristics in the entities that I think were originally metaphorically applied. So you see that here's the, the general framework. 
We have concepts of entities. Now we're trying to spotlight the means that we use to classify those entities, that is characteristics. So we got these entity concepts. If you put two far flung ones together like tiger and lily, you spotlight that characteristic. So you use, uh, it begins as a metaphor, ends up as an adjective. And that's what we wanna know. How do we get adjective concepts? Now bear in mind that these are, I mean, there's nothing more important than concepts of characteristics. Without them, what do you got? We got from previous lectures, we got, okay, dog, table, and we can say animal, dog, animal, woof. It's a big woof. Where are you going with that? Where are you going with dog is animal? What do you know about animals? They look like the animals. What's the point of that? Dog, poodle. What do you know about poodles? They're a certain kind of dog. Hooray, what do you got with that? You don't have anything until you've got knowledge of the characteristics of these things stored in the concepts of them. So if you know, well, dogs have tails, they chew bones, they bark, the female is bitchy when she has her pups, don't approach her. They chase cats. You know, if you have that knowledge and you say, well, poodle is a dog. Oh, I guess poodles chew bones and chase cats. Then you got something. But if all you have is entity concepts and the ability to subclassify them or widen them, you haven't got anything of value yet. Everything that makes us human that I praised at the beginning comes from our ability to say what the entity is. What is it? What is it to be a dog? What are dogs like? What are their characteristics? What do they do? What powers, causal powers do they have? Well, and therefore what can I do to them? You can train a dog. A dog is trainable. Cats less so. What, what does that mean, the causal powers? It means the capacities based upon their characteristics, their properties. <clears throat> so you need these concepts of characteristics, the whole power, the conceptual level, the reason we're here and can talk is that we are not just limited to entity concepts, we can break down the entities into what they are and therefore what they can and can't do. So this is really where the action is. This is really important. Now you can't get to those characteristic concepts unless you have entity concepts. So um, I said there's nothing more important than this, but entity concepts are the precondition of this. So I'm not slighting them. Okay, so the moral I think is Yes, since I'm moving on in a second. The moral is we abstract by differences. We abstract by differentiation. And there's several means of differentiation. The next category is also very interesting. Concepts of consciousness and mystical philosophers say you can't conceptualize consciousness. It's a it's like what Locke said about the substratum. It's a something I know not what. But in fact, if you recognize that consciousness is activity, consciousness is action, you can see how to conceptualize it, and Ayn Rand tells us how to do that. My list of the basic actions of consciousness is somewhat different. It's about 85% overlap with hers. I say the basic actions are sensing, perceiving, conceptualizing, evaluating, emoting, recalling, and imagining. She doesn't have sensing on her list, but I want uh, to include, you know, someone jabs a pin into your hand and it hurts. That's an action of consciousness. It's not an emotion. 
It's a bodily sensation. You feel warm or cold. That's not a perception. It's a bodily sensation. Not greatly important. The important thing is that you can find these basic actions of consciousness and use them to conceptualize everything in consciousness. Ayn Rand says, to form concepts of consciousness, one must isolate the action from the content by a process of abstraction. Well, we know what the process of abstraction is, is differentiation. And I got the idea of saying that from this paragraph. To form concepts of consciousness, one must isolate the action from the content of a given state of consciousness by a process of abstraction. Just as extrospectively man can abstract attributes from entities, hey, that's what I was looking for, I thought, so introspectively he can abstract the actions of his consciousness from its contents and observe the differences, and differences is italicized in her text, among these various actions. And he can also, we're going to get to the method of agreement, he can also observe the similarities. But let's look at the, the idea of differences. Same content, different actions. Her example is a man sees a beautiful woman. Perception. He feels desire, emotion. He imagines she would look better if her hair were dyed blonde. Imagination. Later he remembers her recollection. So those are cases where you take the same object or content and vary the actions of your consciousness. And the other way is you take the same action and vary the contents. So you see a woman, you see a podium, you see a light. They're all seeings as opposed to I feel the podium, I touch it and I feel its shape. I can see its shape, but I can also feel its shape. That's the same object of awareness, different actions, seeing, exploring by touch. Now where does the measurement come in? That's where the abstraction comes in. We've now abstracted seeing from touching or We've abstra uh, abstracted all the different objects from the same woman, awareness of the same woman. Where does the measurement come in? She distinguishes content from intensity. Content is what's out there that you're perceiving or you're inwardly rearranging from what you outwardly perceive. So it comes from the external world or it is the external world if you're directly perceiving it. The intensity is a multidimensional term. It's an umbrella term. It's a multidimensional term, just like extension. Extension, extendedness, spread outedness for the external world comes in three flavors length, width, and depth. So intensity has more than one aspect. For example, its degree of effort involved in grasping it, the degree of clarity, the degree of emotional impact it has on you, the scope, the level of abstractness, if any. So there are many, or several at least, ways to measure intensity, but you have to take the right unit. Measurement of length is by a length, Measurement of weight is by a weight, the pound, the gram. Measurement of an action of consciousness or the intensity of an action of consciousness is by some standard reference of uh, that action. For, she gives us an example. For instance, the intensity of the emotion of joy in response to certain facts varies according to the importance of these facts in one's hierarchy of values. It varies in such cases as buying a new suit or getting a raise in pay or in marrying the person one loves. So you take any of those, okay, the joy I got when I bought that new suit. Getting a raise in pay, well, that was at least 10 times that 
maybe 50 times. Marrying the person I love, well, that's off the scale. All right, we have to force it on the scale. That's the top of the scale. Now, you don't measure them, before we go to axiomatic concepts, you don't measure them exactly in numbers. But the, you know, you can assign a number to it. There's a thing called the dolorimeter, which they have used to measure pain. Ask me about it in the question period. You can rough, you can raise, you know, this is more or less joyful than that. And we use that to perform what Ayn Rand calls teleological measurement. I can get a new shirt or I can get an SSD drive for my computer. Which do I value more? Well, that's easy, the SSD drive, of course. So we do this all the time. Which would we rather buy with the same money? We're ranking the value, the intensity of the value by reference to comparison to another one. All right, quickly, axiomatic concepts. Although they're philosophically extremely important, I don't have much to add to what Ayn Rand says in ITOE. The first thing is that they're prior to axiomatic propositions. They're prior. We don't begin with existence exists or I am conscious or A is A. We begin with, and my, my jaw is dropped open in case you don't see it, which is like it. Then the next stage of identity is a This, that, this, that. Distinguishing among entities on the basis of their characteristics, which you haven't conceptualized, recognizing the same entity that, that oh, that's my mother again, that's her, that's, that's this, different from the dog which you don't have the term for yet, but that's this. I remember that, I recognize that. That's identity. Then consciousness you can get from, I'm opening and closing my eyes. I could stop up my ears. You cannot, however, differentiate any of these things all the way down. You can distinguish this identity from that identity, but you can't distinguish identity from non-identity, because there isn't any non-identity. You can distinguish seeing from not seeing, but you can't distinguish consciousness from unconsciousness, because when you're unconscious, you're not conscious of being unconscious. And even when, if you're in a coma or something, and you come out of it, you can't remember what didn't happen. That is your conscious experience. So for you, everything is within consciousness, and you can only say, well, then I was seeing, I was still there, but I was seeing, and then I was not seeing, and then I was seeing, and then I was not. But there's no such thing of just distinguishing being conscious from being unconscious for yourself. The axiomatic concepts are implicit in all awareness, she says. What does that mean? What does implicit mean there? And, and I've already covered that the three axioms in question are existence, identity, and consciousness. What does it mean that they're implicit? It means all the data are in. You know when the detective on the TV show goes to the blackboard and says, let's put it all together. We found the murder weapon here, and he writes on the blackboard all the data, and then he puts it together. You have all the data, you're ready to put it together about what it is to be, what it is to be something, what it is to be aware of the identity of something. All that you're missing is the generalization, the, the naming of it in a wide integration. Now, the, as, since the axiomatic concepts have no contraries, you don't differentiate to get to them. You continue a process of widening if you're sophisticated enough now to notice that there's widening, you can ask, what's the widest of all? Now, you can't do that until you're a certain age, so these explicitly come pretty late. The, the widest integrations, and I'm very impressed by this 
little thing from Thornton Wilder's Our Town, which is not a play I'm recommending. It's very naturalistic, sentimental. But a, a character gets a, a, a letter addressed as follows. Jane Crowfoot, the Crowfoot Farm, Grover's Corners, Sutton County, New Hampshire, United States of America, continent of North America, Western Hemisphere, the Earth, the solar system, the universe. And yeah, that's the kind of process one goes through to get the concept of the universe or of everything, which is the concept of existence approximately. Now we turn to this aspect of implicit. It all depends on what the meaning of is is. Do people have, does a two-year-old who can say, mommy is here, is is the concept of existence? Is that, or what's that thing? Is thing the concept of entity? Uh, I'm awake, is that the concept of consciousness? Yes and no. Yes and no. They are not the nominalized characteristic or state. Is is to existence as long is to length, or as brotherhood is to brother, or neighborhood is to neighbor, or solidness is to solid. The nominalized terms, the ones with ness or hood or ins, or th are taking out of a certain fact and making it into a kind of subject as if it were an entity. Nouns name entities. Or things treated as if they were entities temporarily, recognizing they're not really entities. Like brotherhood is not a thing, but by making it into a noun, you can say brotherhood can be a drag which is different from saying my brother's a drag and your brother's a drag, and, but not every brother's a drag. Brotherhood can be a drag or uh, the neighborhood. You can talk about the neighborhood, not just the neighbors and where they live and the places. You can make it into a separate object of thought. You can say length can be measured, which otherwise you would have to say long things or short things can be measured. So there are these concepts that are concepts of, of, I want to call them characteristics, but that's not the right way. Concepts of the facts of existence, identity, and conscious, conscious con concepts that use those facts, but don't name them as separate facts. Existence names the isness of what is. Entity names the thingness of things. Identity names the somethinghood of everything. So there is a separate step which doesn't come until late. It's very sophisticated. The concept of consciousness as a separate conscious uh, concept, you know when that came? The Greeks didn't have it. Aristotle did not have the concept consciousness. He had the concept of reason, the concept of perception, he had the concept of all the action of consciousness, but he and none of the Greeks had the uh, concept of that which is true of all of them, consciousness. Augustine, in about 400 AD, maybe a little earlier than that, 300 AD, I forget Augustine's exact dates, but it's way after Greek uh, culture had been supplanted by Rome, Augustine, is the first one to have that concept according to the usual history. So that comes late, historically, and many, I guess, what, 90% of Americans don't have in their vocabulary consciousness or even existence. Maybe they have it, they know it when they, when they hear it, but they don't use that concept. Okay, so axiomatic concepts are, as concepts, very late. As a fact you're aware of, they're there right from the start. From the start, you're aware of things. 
you're aware of what they are, and you are aware of them. So they're implicit in all knowledge. They're perceptually self-evident, but the formulation takes sophistication because there's nothing to contrast them with. As to measurements, Ayn Rand says they retain only one category of measurement, time, which is an interesting and strange statement, right? Why, why would you say that? The existence and consciousness retain the category of time. Thinking about it, my understanding is that you have to get the concept of consciousness and the concept of existence is to grasp that consciousness is secondary to existence. You have to get the primacy of consciousness. Existence exists whether you're aware of it or not. Meaning what? Even during the times at which you're not aware of it, it's there during that time. So to get the independence of existence, you have to grasp time as a category. You have to say, you guys exist while my eyes are shut. While my psychological time does not include you, you're still existing. And to wrap all this up nicely to prepare for lecture five, after we do lecture four, to get to propositions and to fully explain the idea that the senses can't err, E-R-R, but reasoning can, you need to know the difference between saying it looks bent and it is bent. So when you have the stick half submerged in water, there's no error if you say it looks bent. The error comes when you say, as you will, if you don't know what's going on, that's bent. When you say that's bent, you're using axiomatic concepts. Not in a nominalized form, but you're saying, out there in reality, independent of me, its identity is to be similar to these other bent sticks. And it's wrong. And that's an example of error. So to get up to the level of error, you have to have the distinction between what it is really, actually, and I'm claiming it really actually is, versus how I feel about it now, the way it looks to me, what it seems to be now. And that is the use of axiomatic concepts. So axiomatic concepts are necessary to make an assertion which can be then right or wrong. So they give us the possibility of committing to the reality of something and of being wrong. And that's the basis of objectivity. So that will be in lecture five, but it's a nice forward pointer that we have from discussing axiomatic concepts. And I, with that, I'll stop and take questions for the little time that remains. Thank you. Go ahead. And I want to thank you for the lecture. I'm going back a little bit because yeah. of that. <laughs> when we were talking about similarities, I could envision the uh, identifying the similarities, say, of of life to include if you're a right to life or from conception or from not yeah, from conception to <coughs> death <coughs> and if you uh, preferred freedom of choice from birth to death and then it, it, uh, being a or having read Roe v. Wade and, and how it worked out it seemed to me that both parties in that were just totally dumbfounded when someone came in with another idea, and that was viability. You know, when something is viable. Oh, viability, yeah. yes, yes. And it, at first I was ready to put that in the category of similarities from viability to death as a, as a uh -huh. third one. But then I got to thinking more about it and wondered if that was a cross... Um, cross classification? Con concept. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. And that 
because you have viability among a number of different things and viability in various stages, viability with help and without. So mm -hmm. uh, when, that, when that occurred, it, it struck me that you know, perhaps they were dumbfounded because they'd never thought of that being along the different CCD, the, the line yeah. the, of similarities that they were in because it was, uh, it kind of crossed that path. That's right. Of course, if they'd read anything in the area of civil litigation, they would have realized that for a long time, the law has de determined that to be uh, viability to be the main wee way of determining whether someone's entitled to compensation for a death uh, oh, of a... Okay. But, well, let but me it, comment on that. I yeah. get the question. It's a good question. Uh, is it all right if I, if I jump in here? Let's go to the um, question on two levels. First, there's the political, moral question. Should viability be the standard? No. Okay, we settled that. Now let's go to the more interesting epistemological question of what's going on when you introduce viability. And as, as you say, it is, it is a cross-classification. Viability is a potential. Viability says this thing could live if, or would live if. It has the power to do X if the circumstances arise. That is different from the question, what is it? What it could do under circumstances X, which it is not now in, is a different question from what is it, what are its attributes now? And that's the epistemological issue. There's nothing wrong with bringing that in outside of a political context. There's nothing wrong with saying, well, is this wood flammable? Is this, uh, this person intelligent? That's, there's nothing wrong with saying that. But it is a different question from what is it now and what is it doing now? So that is a cross-classification.